Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly show where I interview various guests and learn a little bit more about their perspective on movies. And joining me for this week is podcaster Matt Genovese. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Awesome. So, Matt, before we jump into the questions, we love shameless plugs here on Lost in the Wasteland. So what would you like to shamelessly plug for everybody? So, as you mentioned, I do have a podcast. It's called Mm -hmm. Cool, Epic, Awesome Podcasts. I do it bi-weekly with my brother. And Mm -hmm. I kind of see it as like a book club for movies. Mm -hmm. We take turns recommending a movie to watch every two Mm -hmm. weeks. And then we Mm -hmm. tell the audience, you know, go watch the movie, come back, and we'll all a discussion about it we have you know q a segments stuff like that but i've been doing it for a little over two years and, and i love doing it so yeah hey it sounds like a great way to flex your love for movies and i myself have a movie club with some of my friends on my channel and it's nice to be able to find some community around watching a film and being a cha- getting a chance to chat about it so that's pretty awesome yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. I feel like that's such a big part of film in general is that discussion after the fact, because Mm -hmm. some points of film might just get lost in, you know, you just not picking up on something that a friend might and having that discussion, I think, is really important. I I don't know if it's similar in New York land, but Jersey thing is you go see a movie with a group of people and go to a diner afterwards. That's like movie watching. And chatting about it afterwards, so. Yeah, but. I always prefer, people like to say, you know, a date and a movie. I, f- I feel like a movie and a date is better, because why don't you go to the dinner after so you have something to talk about, you know. There you go. Also, movies aren't the greatest date. Because it's like, if you're actually trying to get to know somebody, you're literally sitting there in silence. Unless you're a jerk, and you talk to yeah. a movie. And don't try that at Alamo Draft House. Uh, oh yeah because they'll actually do something about it like a lot of theaters but also nice that you have that show with your brother i i have sporadically done things on my channel with my brother um he's not always the best at committing to things so usually it's like a couple of episodes of something and then it just trails off but you know that's awesome yeah no i get it i get it (laughs) you and your brother get to have that but Let's get started with everybody's favorite question to be asked who loves movies. What's your favorite film, Matt? So anyone that knows me and knows my film taste will know that my favorite movie and what I think is the best sci-fi movie of all time is Mm -hmm. Arrival, directed by Denis Villeneuve, who is obviously Mm -hmm. more famous now for Dune, part one and two. Um, I just, I love sci-fi. It's one of those movies that, I can watch as this big spectacle, but it's also very personal in its messaging. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the aliens are awesome. They're cool looking. But then when you get the twist and you start to think about what it all actually means, it just hits a lot harder for me. And I've always loved that movie. So, It's a very rich film about communication and a deeply human story with also, you know, giant, strange, mysterious aliens that make strange language. Um, And Amy Adams is fantastic. And I remember seeing that. That was actually a great moment of when to go see a movie and then went to a pizzeria afterwards and talked about it Um, when I got to see that when that came out. But yeah, Denis Villeneuve is definitely at that point where it's like one of the best sci-fi directors out there between this and Blade Runner and then two Dune movies and a third one coming out now. So yeah, Yeah. Arrival is a really special film and which I got a little bit more love. And I thought that might have been the move where Amy Adams actually won an Oscar. But, yeah. I know. Yeah, you brought up her performance. I was going to say that's one of the biggest Oscar snubs in recent memory. I don't think she was even nominated, right? Was she? I'm trying to remember because that was that was La La Land year, yeah. right? So Emma Stone won for that um, back in 2016. That, that was one of those things where it's just like La La Land's going to come in and sweep the world at the Oscars, except that it didn't win Best Picture and had one of the most awkward moments. Of, yeah, it had a uh, fake one. 
that just set the tone for years. The Oscars have had some really awkward moments recently, but Arrival was a special film, and I feel like it's one of those films that's definitely gotten a lot more popularity since then. I think a lot of people have circled around to it since then, which is a good thing. Yeah, and it's it's one that I didn't discover until like a couple of years after it released because I only really got into movies like freshman sophomore year of college. So I'm 23 now. So yeah, talking when I was like 19, 20. So that was like you know, um, I don't know. I just like 2016 was a little bit too early for me to mm-hmm. be going to the theater as much as I am now and keeping up with. Well, um, probably Arrival wouldn't have been a film that really struck a chord in terms of probably how old you were at the time but i think i was what was i 25 when arrival came out and i was deep into my love of film and actually 2016 was when i started my youtube channel so at some point like that was probably one of my earliest videos that i did but speaking of like going back matt what's your earliest memory of going to the movies so for me, I feel like a lot of my earlier memories were animated films. Specifically, I want to I wanna say I remember Toy Story 3 in mm-hmm. 2010. I, for some reason, my family and all my, my mom's sisters and brothers and all our kids, all my cousins, we all went to see that movie t- together. And there's that scene at the end where, you know, all the toys, you think that they're going to meet their end. And I, yep. just, I have a memory of seeing like the adults were crying. And I was like, that's, oh, that's like a memory that always sticks out to me. Yeah, I distinctly remember because I was graduating high school. I graduated high school that month that Toy Story 3 came out. So that like really struck a chord with me. And yeah, that made a lot of adults cry. Toy Story 3 twice. Because <laughs> one, you had the furnace scene. And then you're like, oh, we got through it. And then it's like, toys and you're just like yeah you got me again uh what a but, what a special film starring a nazi fascist pink teddy bear lots of hugging bear yeah and then just to toss in another one really yeah. quick i do i don't know if you ever did this as a kid i don't know if it was like a thing but i was sometimes would go on class trips for my school and they would take us yes. to see a movie so mm-hmm. i remember seeing it had to be like the second or third Pirates of the Caribbean. But I just remember having a blast in the theater because, you know, it's a bunch of whatever we yeah. were, like fourth graders and everyone's, you know, cheering for mm-hmm. whatever was going on. I remember going to a couple of those, but definitely Pirates was one that I remember. I had the weirdest class trip experience in sixth grade. They took us to see the movie Proof from math class. Because, you know, they thought it was going to be about math, but it was just de- like one of Paltrow dealing with depression and her dad, Anthony Hopkins, having Alzheimer's. And there's a bunch of sixth graders being like, what are we watching? Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're I've never actually teachers. seen that. And from what I recall, being a sixth grader, <laughs> I didn't like it very much. But we did see Chronicles of Narnia when that came out. Um, around the same time, and that was that was much more appropriate for a bunch of middle yeah. schoolers to go see. So, yeah, field trips to go see movies always a very interesting interesting decision. Now, Matt, do you have a particular favorite genre of movies? So I I mentioned sci fi a little before, yeah. but my real love is horror, it's oh. particularly slash. It's particularly slasher. I love all those old school. Freddy mm-hmm. Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street is my favorite, but you know I love Halloween. Yep. I love Hellraiser. Maybe not particularly a slasher, but those like old school horror films because I kind of weirdly enough I grew up watching a lot of those because mm-hmm. my dad used to be into them, so he would show me and my brother a lot of the films. And yeah, I still love a good slasher now, although they don't seem to be as common as they were back then. A lot of horror now, people say, like, you know, the A24 horror, yeah. like, the elevated horror, Blumhouse which I still is, like, but... Blumhouse is much more of, like, the pulpy kind of slasher horror stuff. And yeah. you got stuff like Megan, Slasher <laughs> Doll, and stuff which I, like that. 
which I loved. I love Megan. Oh my god, that movie had no right to be as good as it was coming out the first weekend of January. Oh. I know, <laughs> such a random date. Because you know January is just like breeding ground for trash, and yeah, then they Megan just comes throw out. out. Yeah, yeah. The the horror the Blumhouse horror this January was uh, Night Swim. Probably one of the worst movies of the year, I would say. Uh, I'm just <laughs> haunted pool, and I'm yeah. I'm sure the short film that it was based off of was indeed creepy. It didn't work as a full movie, especially yeah. how they made it. But now, um, my brother is super into slasher films, and he would watch Friday the Thirteenth, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street. And scream over and over and over and over and over again. Like, all of them. And I've probably, like, tangentially watched almost every single one of them just from, like, my brother watching them. But I have been getting around to actually, like, checking out. Because, like, the original Halloween is one of my favorite horror films of all time. John Carpenter. Yeah. And just Freddy Krueger's iconic. And Wes Craven with what he did with Nightmare on Elm Street. And then Scream is great. I remember new um Wes Craven's new nightmare scared the yeah. crap out of me when I was a kid but um it's been an interesting year for horror especially I I literally as we're recording this got done watching oddity I had a press screening for link for that and it was built me to the bone it scared the crap out of me just sitting in my recliner my living room yeah. and between that, I can't wait for Long Legs and the new um, Quiet Place and Late Night with the Devil. Like It's been a really good year for horror films so far. So Yeah. Honestly, a film that shocked me that I expected nothing, The First Omen. I don't know if you, if you yes. got around to seeing that. It's one of I, the scariest movies I've seen in a while. I was I randomly saw that on a Thursday opening night at a regal near me and i was one of two people in a 300 seat theater which was not good because yeah. then all you do is sitting there and you're just like <laughs> anything can happen that movie it was so much scarier than i thought it was going to be and um oh, what to i i know she has three names and i get them all mixed up tiger now she is so no, tiger free something like yeah that. yeah she is so good because like I watched all the servant and loved her in that. And yeah, the first omen's one of the most surprising movies of this year. I'm like, I thought it was gonna be trash. Yeah. Um, a prequel to the omen, like decades later, that just screams like cash grab, and then yep. it didn't make any money, but then it was actually good. <laughs> which that's kind of sad, but no, yeah, but hard. you see that more and more nowadays, just mm -hmm. you know. I and saying that I'm also like a big fan of Marvel and superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. So and I know those make the most money and aren't necessarily the best put together films. But it is kind of sad when you see so much effort, like Furiosa we just saw. Mm -hmm. Like incredible filmmaking that just goes to the wayside because people just don't care. And it's a it's a weird sell. If you couldn't tell from all of my branding, I'm a humongous Mac Max fan. And it's just like a two and a half hour prequel to a character from a movie that barely made a profit to begin with. Um, it's a hard sell. But you know yeah. what? Warner Brothers keeps making dumb decisions with money. And we <laughs> between between Blade Runner, Fury Road, and Furio, so I'm like. Warner Brothers, you're done with money, but I'm happy that you are, because at least I've gotten to experience these movies. So keep it going. Just keep wasting your money, yeah. Warner Brothers. You'll you still have like DC movies will hopefully make you some money on the other end. Yeah, we'll see. Well, can you imagine if this new Superman movie fails? Because they have this huge plan already, and it's just they're all all chasing that Marvel MCU high, and it's just like yeah. they barely had a plan start, <laughs> and it's just like you're all doing this wrong. But now, Matt, we talked about genre. Do you have a particular favorite filmmaker? Yeah, I mentioned him before. I think Denis Villeneuve is mm -hmm. is not only my favorite, but I think he's the best working today, pretty easily. Um, 
not just in his sci-fi, but also, mm-hmm. you know, he has great films like Sandy, uh, Sicario. He's just, he hasn't missed yet. Only film of his that I don't particularly love is Enemy, which I, I Jake Hall. Yeah, but... That is his most abstract and inaccessible film, probably. Um, And it's still fascinating to watch, even though I'm like, I don't think I got half of what he was trying to say. But oh, I'm a I'm a huge Villeneuve fan too, and Prisoners hit me in a very visceral way. I remember watching that for the first time and just being like, I felt like I was like shattered inside. Yeah, um, just and a, also, it's a brutal movie. And he it's... jacked and scared the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, where's this man's Oscar? That, that's one of my biggest snubs is that the fact that Hugh Jackman did not even get acknowledged at all for Prisoners because he's just so good in that. Jake Gyllenhaal's great in that. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Melissa Leo doesn't get talked about a whole lot from it and she has a small role in it, but she's so good. And Paul Dano is so creepy. Yes, yeah. so he's like creepy. perfectly cast in that role. Absolutely. He is perfectly cast as a creepy person in a lot of movies. It really works, unfortunately, yep. for him. Um, but no, Dylan is definitely one of the best directors we have working today. And yep. I don't even care that it's just like doom, doom, doom. It's like if they're that good, people coming. <laughs> so Yeah. And then another one kind of on the other end, and this this might be controversial, but I really love Taika Waititi. Jojo Rabbit's one of my favorite movies of all time. What We Do in the Shadow is one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. He hasn't been as great recently, but... I don't understand how people so quickly were just like, we hate you, and just like... Like, it wasn't that long ago that, like, Ragnarok and yeah. Jojo Rabbit came out, and it was just like, COVID happened, and then Taika Waititi became, like, en- enemy number one. I really enjoyed Next Goal Wins. It's so a fun, I. inspirational, funny movie. Yeah. And I'm just like, so many people who are bad, like, it got really middling reviews. I'm just like, you probably don't want to have any fun. Like, I don't get this. <laughs> and I probably defend Thor Love and Thunder more than most, well, the vast majority of people. It's still a messy movie. But I'm like, I feel like people were just like, it was complete steaming pile of trash. I'm like, it's like good things in this movie. Um, yeah, I it's feel definitely like not there's... the worst Thor movie. No, it wasn't I... boring. <laughs> Thor the Dark yeah. World. <laughs> um, there's probably a longer cut of that movie somewhere because that movie should not have been an hour and 55 minutes. Um, but it felt it. Yeah. it felt like somebody was like, but Taika TT is so funny, and he balances a really funny sense of humor and some really heavy elements so perfectly. Yeah. Hunt for the Wilder People is one of my favorite movies of the past ten years. I just love that movie to pieces. That's a great one. I that's one that I have been meaning to get back to. I watched that kind of for I was really to film too much so it's definitely one that i'm gonna get back to but also like boy is a great movie i don't know if you've ever seen that one and just Mm -hmm. like what you said just something like jojo rabbit just bouncing one scene it's you know it's a imaginary friend hitler dancing around and then next scene it's you know hanging repair shoes shoes. and it's yeah just being able to nail that is yeah that is one of the most traumatic scenes i've i've seen in the movie I distinctly remember seeing Jojo Rabbit and Parasite the same day because they both came out in my local theater AMC at the same weekend and Mm -hmm. my wife and I went back to back and that was an emotionally devastating and draining experience back to back. I just remember the camera panning and just those shoes and I'm just like I'm not okay. This is not okay. Uh, This movie... And No Dead Rabbit was my favorite movie from 2019. Um, that's probably a hot take for a lot of people because, like, that was a stacked year for movies. Yeah. I'm assuming most people have Parasite at number one. <laughs> there. Um, 
Now, thinking about in front of the camera, who are some of your favorite actors, actresses? So the one that comes to mind for me is Joaquin Phoenix. He's another mm-hmm. one that I think he's the best working actor today, in my opinion. He's just so versatile, and you could he just buys into his role so much. He completely mm-hmm. transforms into his character. Like, if you look at something like, you know, The Master, and then compare it to What Was Afraid, just like yes. two completely different characters, and then something like Her, where he plays, what's he has a weird name, Thombly, something like that. Theodore, forget, but... Um, yep. It's <laughs> he is a chameleon of an actor because like I've I've known Joaquin Phoenix as an actor for a long time because God I watched Signs when I was like eleven <laughs> that's when that came out and yeah. that scared the shit out of me as a kid but like he was really good in that with Mel Gibson and then Gladiator of course mm-hmm. and he he is such a shit. He's like one of those characters where I'm just like, I am looking forward to watching you die at the end of this movie. And then you're right with like stuff like The Master and Bo is Afraid. I feel like it's such a weird movie that people just forgot how good of a performance he gave in it. Yeah. Because that was, he was my favorite performance of, la- of last year. I mean, no recognition at all. Well, favorite male performance besides yeah. uh, Emma Stone, but well, and, and that's very interesting because both of them gave very weird performances and yeah. very weird movies. It's just one of them actually got more attention than the other. God, I I can't even quantify just how weird Bo was afraid was. And sitting in, I saw, saw that in a packed theater too. I'm like, I'm like, all these do all these people know what they're getting into? And no, they yeah. didn't. Because the reactions yeah, after the movie were priceless. I love Bo is Afraid, but the thing that I always think back to about it is, did A24 actually think this would be a success? I'm pretty sure it was their most no. expensive film they've yeah. ever done. Three hours long, just complete absurdity, and it just bombed. Like, Did they ever think it was going to succeed? There was... like That was probably a24 at their most auteur just like throw caution to the wind because there's no way in hell that was making money there's no commercial prospects for that movie at all and then obviously they did civil war this year which was even bigger but also visceral and uncomfortable but more accessible than post afraid well besides joaquin who else so I actually to talk about act an actress. I love Natalie mm-hmm. Portman a lot. She is someone that I loved as a kid from the Star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. Padme. She was like yeah. one of my first crushes as a kid. I feel like um, a lot of <laughs> was certainly was a crush, big crush for a lot of people growing up. Certainly my brother, as I speak for him, because my brother also loves Natalie Portman. Yeah, and then when I first started getting into movies, one of the first films that i watched that was elevated was black swan and that's one of the greatest performances of all time in my opinion from her and he's incredible that film is incredible and so uncomfortable yeah i didn't think a cuticle could freak me out yeah, as much as that one scene did. But no, she's incredible. Just the range that she has to deliver as that character going from so fragile and set, overly sensitive to like, when she becomes that black swan, like that's intense. That's intensity. Yeah. And it's just like, Natalie Portman's commanding this. And mm-hmm. she's going for it. It was so fantastic. Yeah, to talk about Oscar snubs too, I gotta bring it up May, December. I think she should have been nominated too. It was pretty tough competition, but that, great, movie, that movie completely disappeared. Yeah. Um and like big award shows, like that just disappeared. Um lot of three great acting performances that wound up getting represented. Um mm-hmm. did it wind up getting nominated for writing? Um Trying to remember, I, I feel like it got like one nomination. I, th- I don't that. know if it did at the. I feel like it might have at the Golden Globes because mm-hmm. they have 
the more they separate it by genre, so yeah. you're more likely to. I don't know if it was Oscar nominated, but I don't think so. It probably got nominated for comedy too. Yeah, <laughs> just knowing that. Yeah. It's just like it's up there with the greatest comedy, The Martian. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, like it just who even decides this stuff? Those boards at the award shows, like I just don't understand the, sometimes their decisions. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association is a weird ass group of people that make no sense uh for the Golden yeah. Globes. The Academy Awards is like hundreds of people voting on all these things. And May December was, I feel like just such a taboo and strange topic to tackle and the yeah. way that it was tackled was in such an interesting and strange way i just feel like and yet poor things want to <laughs> so obviously they watch weird stuff it happens apparently only one is your ghost land the most so there you go now Matt, what's a film that you feel like you could just watch literally every day so that that's a tough question for me because I tend not to rewatch too often. Mm-hmm. The only time I really rewatch stuff is if I want to show my girlfriend something that I mm-hmm. that I've already seen. But I really think of like animated films for this. Uh, I feel like Ratatouille is my favorite Pixar movie, one that I could just throw on in the background, and I found myself just occasionally being like, I feel like watching Ratatouille right now. Just yeah. putting it on. It's it's like it's a very comforting movie for me. So it's just like a nice classic order of Ratatouille. Just brings that nostalgia back. That yeah. that moment with Anton Ego where it just like snaps him back to childhood is just like Pixar will do that to you. You're just sitting watching a Pixar movie. I'm like, I remember being a little kid. Uh yeah. watching all of these. Because I certainly had a lot of them on VHS when I was a kid. Um, because they were still around. Um, but no, Ratatouille is a Ratatouille is one of their best, honestly, yeah. and it's probably one of their most mature ones too. Which sounds so weird—a movie about a like a, a rat wanting to become a cook would be the yeah. one of the most mature Pixar movies. But it's like it doesn't deal with a whole lot of things that you expect in kids' movies, like. It's a story about like an aspiring chef. I'm like, you see this in like the bear <laughs> stuff like yeah, that. And it's, this, this it's really, it's about nostalgia, really, which yeah. a, a kid couldn't possibly understand that, you know. So, and it's something yeah, like soul as well, like, just to bring, yes, just to bring up like a more, <laughs> a more serious Pixar, like soul. That was fantastic. Mm-hmm. That was like very mature. That movie. God, I almost had an ex- existential crisis. Watching that on uh, Christmas morning. Yeah, it released during COVID. I remember just locking in and just watching it while we were in quarantine. I loved it. Yeah, there's that one moment where that guy slips into that void. I thought I was going to have an existential crisis sitting on my couch. I'm like, what is this? This is not okay. And Pixar can do that to you. I thought these were for kids. A lot of animations for kids. That's what everybody says. Not when it yeah, comes yeah. to Pixar. They're ready to cry and feel some things. So this is probably my favorite question that I like to ask on this first round is film that you connect with because it relates to another interest of yours. This one was another another question that's kind of difficult for me because film really is my interest. <laughs> you know. There you go. So my first thought was like films about filmmaking like Mm -hmm. Babylon uh the Fablemans stuff like that but thought a little bit harder about it so I I I'm a huge fan of basketball so one movie that that I watched that I really connected with in that way was Coach Carter just having that high school basketball experience and a great underrated performance by Samuel L. Jackson I didn't it's like a very different role for him more stoic in a way compared to like his usual there's not a lot of big yelling mother effers at people or just being yeah. like cool and now that, that was a great era for inspiring sports movies between that like i literally just re-watched remember the titans today 
Mm-hmm. And like Denzel Washington and that, Samuel L. Jackson, Coach Carter. It's like those kind of sports movies can really hit that um that chord of inspiring and Coach Carter is definitely one of those films that's a very inspiring film. So, and I'm also a big, I'm a big sports fan. I love baseball. I love baseball movies. And when like you're a sports fan and like they do your sport right in a movie, yeah. it's special. Yeah. That's a big problem. I feel like, especially with basketball, there's a famous clip from Amazing Spider-Man. I don't know if you know what I'm referring to or not, but it's just like the most weak, shot attempt ever that just gets completely denied and you're like there's no way these filmmakers have ever touched the basketball in their life <laughs> it, honestly baseball is probably one of the best sports for movie making and there's been so many great baseball movies there's a lot of great basketball movies i feel like hoosiers is probably like the most famous basketball movie yeah. and like that's Almost like oh, it's not almost. That is forty years old, isn't it? <laughs> so like, it's been decades. And I enjoyed Hustle, the new Adam Sandler movie. Yeah, I liked was, Hustle too. That was more of like the behind the scenes kind yeah, of stuff yeah. than the actual game. Uh, the first Slam Dunk, honestly, that new anime that came out last year was probably the coolest basketball movie I've ever seen. So yeah, I think I my recommend. brother's into anime. I think he watched that. He said it was good. Oh, it was one of the most exhilarating sports movies I've ever watched. And, you know, this year turned out to have one of the most crazy, like most unexpected sports movies and challengers. I'm like, I have never been that exhilarated watching tennis in my whole entire life. So, yeah, you'll never get that excitement from watching a match. No, it's Guadagnino, something special. Um, He loves tennis, obviously. Now, what's the movie character, Matt, that you feel like you connect with on a personal level? Uh, one that comes to mind for, for this is uh, Sonny Soljic's character, Stevie, from mid-90s. And I okay. feel like not not like who I am now, but I connected yeah. with him, like seeing myself in him as a kid, sort of like you know, doing the wrong things to impress people and falling in with the wrong crowds and being conflicted in that area of life. I really, like, really connected deeply with his character in that movie. And that was also one of the movies that really got me into film to begin with. It was one of the first films that I saw that I was like, wow, you know, this is what good filmmaking is. So It's like you had that moment where you're like, this is cinema. You had the Scorsese moment. Uh it's I remember when that came out and I had a very visceral reaction to mid nineties being a period piece. Um and just being like now I'm feeling old that they're making this nostalgic period pieces about the mid nineties. I'm like, oh my god, I grew up in the mid nineties. <laughs> and like also like the fact that like Jonah Hill made that, I'm like, Yeah, okay, Jonah Hill. And it's definitely one of those films that really captures that experience growing up and being a kid mm-hmm. i'm really excited for dini that's going to be coming out yeah. because that kind of gives me a similar kind of vibe and they're just like sitting on these old computer older computers making videos and stuff like that i'm just like oh man <sighs> and then the music kicked in i'm like oh my god this really is like time stamping this right now. Yeah. So and getting that like childhood experience is mm-hmm. one of the hardest things for filmmakers to do because you know they're not kids. So it's not so most anymore. of them it's it's so far removed from when they were there that it's hard to really fully capture that feeling. So yeah. when you see someone able to do it, it's always very impressive to me. Absolutely. Now, what's a film that you love, Matt, that you think would surprise people? All right. So I actually do like the occasional rom-com. Okay. Um, I'm a big 500 Days of Summer fan. Okay. I love that movie. Um, but I feel like saying the rom-coms is a bit of a basic answer. So I'm going to give you another one. And I was reminded of this actually last night because I watched that Jim Henson documentary mm-hmm. and 
the Muppets movie. I love the Muppets. I'm a big Muppets fan of the Muppets. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Not only the original Muppets movie, but also the the newer one with Amy Adams. Both mm-hmm. great movies. I I literally own what one two three four five I own six Muppet movies and intend on owning more because I do love the Muppets and that's I actually got to see the Muppet movie for its re-release for its yeah forty fifth anniversary that was um, recent I remember seeing the coming attractions mm-hmm. for that. Yeah, because it did the Fathom events. Um, I love TCM screen classics, and that was such a fun time seeing that in the theater and just seeing all the cameos. Yeah, like Mel Brooks playing like a Nazi son <laughs> randomly in the yeah. Muppet movie, and Steve Martin being the biggest jerk of a waiter at a restaurant but no and the muppets are so much fun i cannot tell you how many times i watch muppet christmas carol actually i could can i've literally watched muppet christmas carol every single christmas season since i was a toddler so i have legitimately watched that movie 30 times in my life and yeah i listen to the music casually on spotify (laughs) Muppet I mean, Treasure Island's up there too. Yeah, they Rainbow Connection is probably one of the, the best songs from a movie. Also, yep. even Manor of Muppet from the most recent one. Rashid so, song. My mind was blown when I found out that Brett McKenzie of Flight of the Concords wrote all the music for that Muppet movie. And then I'm like, this is why this music's so good. And it's so funny. Because like Manor Muppet is like just yeah. music for a movie and even the rap that Clips Cooper does is hilarious and so unexpected um, also one of the funniest gags in the history of a movie is the fact that he can't actually laugh so he just says maniacal laugh maniacal laugh <laughs> and I'm just like they could only get away with this in a Muppet movie and this yeah. is the effort so yes I also love the Muppets, so I appreciate that. But also, 500 Days of Summer, that's a very interesting film because they feel like the perspective on it really changes with you as you get older. Because I remember a lot of people being like seeing themselves a lot in just Gordon Levitt's character and being like, mm-hmm. wow, Summer was a jerk. And then it's like you watch it as you get older and you're just like, oh, he just wasn't that into him. He yeah. just would not let it go. Yeah. And it depends. It depends. You can like pull from your real life of which of the two characters yeah. you're relating to in that moment. Because I think that movie is really framed with him as the villain, you know. But if you're maybe maybe you just got your heart broken by a girl, you might see yourself a little bit in Yeah. And the film throws you for a loop because, like, you have, like, the fun romantic, like, the whole sing and dance number to Paul and Oates. And, like, Mm -hmm. that's so much fun. And then you strip it all away and you're just like, oh, crap. Like, this dude just will not let this shirt go. And it's it's an interesting film. And it's like the anti-rom-com. It's just like it yeah. tricks you into thinking it's a rom com, and then you realize no, actually, it's really similar. It's a movie. Yeah. But honestly, one of my favorite scenes in any movie is the expectation versus reality scene in that movie. Just so perfectly well, like displayed, like the visual storytelling of it, and it's just like that's exactly what we do before we're going into a situation of oh, this is how everything's going to go. It's going to be so perfect, this and that, and it's never like that. It's yeah. never like that. What a question for you. How how well-versed are you in Woody Allen movies? I've seen a couple. What's the one with Owen Wilson? Midnight in Paris. Oh, Midnight in Paris. Have you seen Annie Hall? I thought. Would recommend because Mark Webb obviously watched Annie Hall and had some influence there. So I find I I'll find it interesting to hear what you say when you wind up watching that. Because that's definitely where he got that vibe from. 
because there's a scene in that too where it's just like and god Woody Allen's so awkward and weird yeah. <laughs> and it's so uncomfortable and cringy like some uh that kind of scene that plays out in that but man I have one last question for you what do you love most about movies well the first thing that comes to mind is the theater experience Mm-hmm. I've had some amazing experiences in the theaters, especially for these big, like I've talked about Marvel, like these ensemble films. I remember seeing Avengers Endgame with my dad. There were people j- jumping and screaming and just like the complete euphoria and joy of a, of this big crowd of people watching a movie. Um, there's that end of the spectrum of theater experience and then there's the other end which is also great which is you know something like dune 2 and imax where it's like a completely yes. just getting sucked into this world and just being able to you know escape reality for a little bit and that's another thing that i love about films i've talked about how I, my two favorite genres are sci-fi and horror and they're the least like our reality yeah, you know, I like I like being able to see things on screen that you don't see in real life. I like mm-hmm. seeing big alien invasions and superheroes and things like that. So, yeah, I hundred percent can relate to the movie theater going experience, and more and more, I wind up seeing movies completely alone in a theater, and it makes me sad. Um, no, don't be sad. I, I've done that plenty of times. Sometimes my best experiences. It makes me sad that there's not more people going out to the movies and seeing movies. Sometimes it is really nice to just have to keep it to yourself. Because sometimes people yeah. can be horrible and yes. don't want to watch a movie with them. I definitely feel what you're talking about. Back when they only had midnight show times before movie coming out on Thursday and going to see Avengers in 2012. 15 other people from college and taking up literally a whole entire row at an AMC near Ryder's campus, which uh, for went out for AMC Hamilton, still sad that it died during COVID. Um, and just that experience of sitting there. I didn't even hear the puny God line from Hulk after he ragdolled Loki because <laughs> everybody was laughing and cheering so loud. Yeah. Um, I, the way that you could hear a pin drop at the end of Avengers Infinity War was something else. Like, a whole entire stacked theater of people and nobody said a thing. I was sitting there, just, my jaw was just yeah. sitting there at the screen and even my other brother, John, um, my brother's best friend, started shaking me. It's like, say <laughs> I'm just like I was so dumbfounded by it, and I don't go to the movies multiple times to see a movie, but I did see Avengers Endgame three times in the theater, and yeah. every time, some something special. So that theater going experience, and I, I specifically went up to New York City to Lincoln Square AMC to see Dune Part Two on yeah, that that's like... largest IMAX screen in the country. Yeah. Yep. So perfect. That and Oppenheimer I've seen in that theater, which was my god, Killian Murphy's head was so big. Um, <laughs> entire movie. Now, Matt, I always like to wrap up this show by letting my guests ask me a question. So what would you like to ask the Wasteland reviewer? So my question for you, and now that I've been following you on Letterboxd for a bit and seeing <laughs> your, you already know where this is going. How do you watch the amount of movies that you watch? How do you make time for for this hobby? Because that's something that I struggle with a lot. It's... I don't think I could do this if I weren't the kind of person that I am. Because, like, I I get, for the best I can, like, six hours of sleep every night. I don't need a ton of sleep. Um, And I get wake up at five o'clock every morning... It's really a matter of, like, I commit to making sure that I watch a new movie every day. Um, I'm not the most adventurous going out kind of person. So, like, I'm more than happy to just chill at home watching movies. 
Um, my wife also reinforces that. So that also helps. Having a supportive partner is a big part of being able to make that work. And it's just a matter of commitment to it. And I happen to be a very driven person that I do not like just sitting around and doing nothing. So I always have to be doing something. So I always want to have something on or go into the movies. And, you know, it's evolved over time. Because, like, growing up, I didn't go to the movies very often. I would be lucky yeah. if it was, like, once every couple of months going to the movies. And then, like, going up to, like, COVID, I was going to the movies five, di- five days a week. Um, and then post-COVID, it's – I feel very lucky that I get a lot of press screening links and stuff like that, which also yeah. helps – um the watching a lot of those things from the convenience of my own home makes it a lot easier than having to drive to a theater sitting through 30 minutes of trailers movie and then driving home so that also helps but it's just a matter of like really committing to it and you know as i get into other part uh stages of my life like eventually having kids that's not gonna happen anymore like so yeah. i'm enjoying the ride now uh, <laughs> so but, you know, it's something that I love film. I love talking about film. This is episode, I think, 204 or five of this show. I've been doing this Impressive. literally yeah. every single week for four years. Because I started this during COVID because I wanted an excuse to talk to people. And talking about movies is great. So it's just a matter of like really committing to it and being the kind of person where it's just like, I'm always going to be doing something yeah. and making the time. And I micromanage my whole entire life in my head. That's just the kind of person that I am. So. All right. Wait, bonus question. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you have a goal for your channel in the next, say, six months? What's your goal? I would love to hit 2000 subscribers. That would be great. I'm like 220 away. Um, This is really big for me because it took me like five, six years to crack 100 subscribers. Like basically I was just doing this for me and not yeah. a whole lot of traction with things. And then probably COVID certainly helped. Um, People being trapped at home and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I want to keep these shows going. Um. My favorite show that I do is my Welcome to the Wasteland, where I take a deep dive into a particular director. And in six months, I'll finally be done this 80-week journey of John Ford, and I could finally Jeez. move on to somebody <laughs> else. Which, there's been a lot of films that I've loved from John Ford, but I'm all John Ford out. It just, it's been a lot. And I'll be starting yeah. Wes Anderson in January, and he's one of my favorite directors, so that'll be fun. Um, yeah. And my hope is to always keep meeting new people and having new, fresh, like, I love talking movies with my friends and sure, having them on for their fifth and sixth time on the show is great. But like, I always like making new connections with people and having new guests on. And, you know, my hope is to have some more filmmakers on. I've gotten a chance to have a couple on recently and actors that I've made uh connections with which has been really cool so that's probably cool. some of the things yeah. i'm looking forward to all right great i'll be along for the ride so well i appreciate I'm wishing it, you man. the best yeah and i would love to have you back on again i have other shows too you're more than welcome to come and obviously i'd like to circle back around and have you on this show again because i have like six rounds of questions <laughs> and um more than happy to collaborate again but matt Thank you so much for taking the time and chatting movies with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. So Awesome. And make sure to check out Max Podcast. I'll put all the information in the description of the video. But most importantly, thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Review.